And we're looking at how to build a healthy body. And we're not talking about Jack LaLanne. I lived in California long enough to hear the legendary stories of Jack LaLanne, you know, the man who could pull a boat full of people with a rope between his teeth swimming in the Pacific Ocean. And uh, he was legendary, a bodybuilder who had an Olympic physique into his mid-70s. Uh, but that's so passing and so transient. I remember the first time we met Arnold Schwarzenegger uh, and had breakfast with him, and I saw him up close, and I thought, you know, that's what happens to a Mr. Universe, because that muscle, uh, if it's not constantly worked on, becomes something other than muscle. And uh, he is big. And I thought about what, what extreme measures people take their bodies to make it beautiful, too. And yet God says bodily exercise profits a little. But what we're going to talk about tonight in verse 18 has profit both in this world and, most importantly, in the world to come. Let's look at the 18th verse, and it says this, Therefore, comfort one another with these words. How do we build a healthy spiritual body? How do we build our body in Christ? How do all of us participate in being a part of what Christ is doing? Because right now Christ said he is building his church. And if Jesus is doing something, I want to do it too. If he is involved in something, I want to be involved with him. Now, not in competition. Jesus said he would build the church, but he gave us a part. And he said, we can be vitally involved in building his church by, look at verse 18, doing something we can all do tonight, comforting one another. Now, listen, one of the things for sure that the early church knew how to do was they knew how to be involved in comforting one another. They knew how to comfort one another because of what they were going through. They faced such a hostile world that was totally united against them that they had nowhere to turn but to God and to one another because nobody else wanted them. They were slowly squeezed out of society. That's why the writer of the book of Hebrews just before A.D. 70 said, you are taking joyfully the spoiling of your goods. What does that mean? It means when you came to Christ, you started losing your stuff because you were ostracized by your family. You were, you were losing your job oft times. You were shoved out of your property ownership oft times. And pretty soon you were imprisoned and beaten and you were paying a great price. And so you took joyfully the loss of your physical possessions. Now, this morning, I was talking about loving the Lord and about how we could trust God. But if you knew that trusting God, and you're going to lose your house, your car, your job, your investment in your pension fund, would you think twice about it? I know we all would. It's not that we would say no to Christ, but we would think twice about coming here if it meant we were going to lose all that. But that's what coming to Christ meant in century one. And these people were facing the reality that there was no one that they could lean on but each other. Let me tell you about one person. This is probably the most well-known martyr after Stephen in the early church because this fellow was the pastor of the church that we read about in chapter 2 of Revelation, Smyrna. You don't have to turn there. I'm just going to read uh, what was recorded about the death of Polycarp. Now this guy, his name was Polycarp, Pastor Polycarp. He was a man led to Christ by the Apostle John and he was led to Christ in the first century by John before John died during his public ministry at the end of the first century in the 90s. And he was a young man then, and he grew in the Lord, and by the, the beginning of the second century, in the 100s, he grew in spiritual leadership and became the pastor of the church at Smyrna. Remember, it was Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, the first three churches. Smyrna was a suffering church. He was a pastor of that church. And I want to read to you the price he paid to be a believer. The martyrdom of Polycarp is one of the better-known stories from the pages of early Christian history. And if you like this, you can, there are a lot of great books. Fox's Book of Martyrs. What a great, that used to be read all the time by Christians. What a great, and that's what this is from. This is the account from Fox's Book of Martyrs of this pastor's martyrdom for Christ. We have no idea who the original author uh, was but uh, of this account, but we do know who Polycarp was, and this person recorded his death. He apparently was a disciple of the Apostle John who served as the pastor of the church of Smyrna, not far from the city of Ephesus. He wrote a letter to the Philippian church, but over the years, Christians have remembered Polycarp most of all as a steadfast martyr who dared to defy the Roman authorities in the year 155. Let me tell you what happened. There were riots against the Christians that broke out in the city of Smyrna in 155. 
Polycarp's friends urged him to withdraw to a farm outside the city, which he did. But members of his own household disclosed his hideout. They tortured them and said, where's Polycarp? And they said, he's hiding in this farm. And so the police, the official Romans, came to arrest him and they delivered him to the proconsul. That's the local head of the province at the city arena, which was crowded with spectators awaiting the execution of this notorious leader of the Christians. When he entered the arena, the proconsul gave him the choice. He said, curse the name of Christ, make sacrifice to Caesar, or die. Polycarp said, 80 and 6 years, I have served him as my king who saved me. How can I blaspheme my Lord? The proconsul threatened him with burning. Polycarp replied, You threaten me with fire that burns for a time and is quickly quenched? You do not know that the fire that awaits the wicked in the judgment to come is an everlasting punishment. Why are you waiting? Come do what you will, he said. But the proconsul was insistent. He said, Take the oath and I will release you. Curse Christ. Polycarp said, How can I blaspheme my king who saved me? When he had said these things and many besides, he was inspired with courage and joy and his face was full of grace, this anonymous author says, so that not only did he not fall with dismay at the thing which was said to him, but on the contrary, the proconsul, the Roman leader, was so astonished that he sent his own herald into the arena to proclaim three times, Polycarp has confessed himself to be a Christian. Polycarp has confessed himself to be a Christian. Polycarp has confessed himself to be a Christian. When this was said by the herald, the entire crowd of heathen and Jews who lived in Smyrna shouted with uncontrollable anger and a great cry, This one is the teacher of Asia, the father of the Christians, the destroyer of our gods. He teaches many to not sacrifice to them their worship. These things then happened with such dispatch quicker than can be told. The crowds were in so great a hurry that they gathered wood and and burning coals of fire from the workshops, from the public baths. The Jews were especially zealous, as usual, to assist with this killing of the Christians. And with his hands put behind him and tied like a noble ram out of the great flock ready for sacrifice, as a burnt offering ready and acceptable to God, Polycarp looked heavenward. And this is his prayer that this anonymous scribe recorded. Lord God Almighty, Father of the Beloved and Blessed Servant, your your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, I bless thee because thou hast deemed me worthy of this day and this hour to take part in the number of thy martyrs, in the cup of Christ, for the resurrection to eternal life of the soul and the body, in the immortality of the Spirit, among whom I may be received into thy presence and this day as a rich and acceptable sacrifice. For this and everything I praise thee and bless and glorify thy name. And when he had concluded the amen and finished his prayer, the men attending to the fire lit it. They were going to tie him to the stake, but he said, leave me as I am, for he who gives me the power to endure the fire will grant me to remain in the flames unmoved, even without the security you will give by the nails. So they left him loosely bound in the flames, and Polycarp died for Christ. Now, that's an interesting account, isn't it? Do you see why the Christians had to encourage one another? I mean, when someone teases us, it chagrins us. When someone confronts us, oftentimes it frightens us and we don't want to cause a problem. But these people were hunted down, dragged out, nailed, burned, and scourged and everything else. If someone you loved were let out by our local government official and executed, Would you need some encouraging? I would. Life without persecution is hard enough, let alone what they went through. But let's just zip the tape forward. I want to read to you two accounts that might surprise you. Some pretty well-known Christians of a century ago. And I want to share their struggles. Here's the first one. He said this, You seem to imagine that I have no ups and downs, but just a level and lofty stretch of spiritual attainment with unbroken joy and equanimity. By no means. I am often perfectly wretched and everything appears most murky in my soul. So wrote the man who was called in his day the greatest preacher in the English-speaking world, Dr. John Henry Jowett. He pastored the leading church of the world. He preached to thousands. He wrote books that were bestsellers. And yet, he said, I struggle and need encouragement 
every day. Here's a second one who said this, quote, I am the subject of depressions of spirit. I am so fearful that I hope that none of you ever get to the extremes of wretchedness to which I go. These words were spoken in a sermon by Charles Haddon Spurgeon, whose marvelous ministry to London made him perhaps the most well-known preacher England's ever produced. What do these men have in common with Polycarp? Verse 18 of chapter 4, the necessity we have to encourage one another, the privilege we have to build up Christ's body by our words of encouraging, consoling, and strengthening others with the word of God, by the power of the Holy Spirit, with our voices and with our hearts. The Word of God speaks about comfort 66 times in the New Testament in 62 different verses. Comfort is vital. It's an imperative in our spiritual lives. But who's supposed to be comforting? Well, let me introduce you to the cast. There are basically five different comforters that are mentioned in the Bible. Here's the first one. Look at Acts chapter 9, okay? With me, please. Acts chapter 9, verse 31. Here's the first one in the cast of comforters. The book of Acts chapter 9 and verse 31, because the first comforter is the one whose name is comforter, and it says in verse 31, the church throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria enjoyed peace, being built up and going on in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the comforter. Who's that? Holy Spirit. Who's the first cast member in the ministry of comfort? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit whose name is the paraclete, the one para means alongside and uh, kletos means to be called. He's called alongside of us. In fact, comfort means to come alongside, to be called alongside, to, to come alongside those in need, and not to just from a distance, merely from a distance, but also in person, in presence, to come alongside of someone and to comfort them. And the Holy Spirit is the one who is called alongside of us, Acts 9.31. Now look at 2 Corinthians 1, and we're going to spend some time in this uh, uh, little bit of this chapter, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, and this is the most comforting chapter in the Bible. In fact, in these short verses, comfort is used ten times in five verses. This is the, the main expression of this concept of comfort. And who we find comforting in this chapter, in chapter 1 of 2 Corinthians, look at verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, and what? the God of all comfort. Who's the second person in the cast of comforters? The Holy Spirit comforts. God the Father has called himself with the name the God of all comfort. He says, I am the God who comforts my people. I am the God of all comfort. Two cast members. Here's the third one. Back to uh, Romans. Just back a little, little tad. Romans chapter 15 and verse 4. It says this. Romans 15, 4. We have God the Holy Spirit comforting. We have God the Father comforting. Romans 15 and verse 4. That whatever was written in earlier times was written for our instruction that through the perseverance and the encouragement, that's the same word for comfort, of the scriptures, we might have hope. So what's another source of comfort? Right here in front of you. One of the most powerful things, the most blessed decision you can make in your Christian life is to be regularly in this book. This book will keep you from sin, and sin always keeps us from this book. But this book is a source. It says in Romans 15, 4, look at it. The comfort or the encouragement of the scriptures, we have hope. One last one before we go back to 2 Corinthians. Look at Philippians chapter 2 and verse 11. The cast of comforters, the Holy Spirit comforts us. Acts 9, 31. The Father himself is called the God of all comfort. 2 Corinthians chapter 1. God's word is a source of comforts. Romans 15 and verse 4. But look at Philippians 2.11. It says, excuse me, 2.1, not 11. 2.1, if therefore there's any encouragement in Christ. That's the word comfort again. Paraklesis. It's if any coming alongside, if any encouraging of our lives. And who is the one that comforts us? Christ. So the cast of comforters is the Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Fourthly, the Word of God and our text tonight. Who else is in the cast of comforters? Us, right? We're supposed to be. We're the fifth member. We're supposed to be comforting one another. How do we do it? We do it in the power of the Holy Spirit. We do it through the might of God the Father. We do it by the example of Jesus Christ. We do it through the Word of God. 
But what is comforting? And how do you do that? And that's why we need to go back to 2 Corinthians chapter 1. I want to spend a little time with you in that passage because the Word of God says that we are to be involved in the most blessed ministry. We are to be involved with God the Father. I mean, I hear people all the time say, wow, I'm going in partnership, or, or our company is bought by this company, or you read it in the news, you know, that, wow, WorldCom is hooking up with MCI, you know, or, or this company is going with that, or Williams, you know, is taking this company over. Wow, a big partner is going to really help the business. Well, guess what? God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit want to partner with us using this book so that we can be coming alongside of other Christians and comforting, consoling, encouraging for the purpose of building up the body of Christ. Look at 2 Corinthians 1 with me, and I just want to point out these comforts. First, let me read to you, and you can just follow along in verse 3. And it might help you. I have them all circled in my Bible. Uh, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, and the God of all, what? Comfort. It's okay to talk in church, okay? Um, Not like they do in the South. I've told you that story. It's very hard to preach down South, especially in the black churches. You know why? Amen. Uh, Right, all the way through. I mean, you can't take a breath without, uh, amen. Yes, preach, brother. And after a while, you just get all, I get all mixed up where I am. And so, thank you for not being too Southern. I'm not used to that. But it's okay to talk uh, and respond. Verse 4, who what? Comforts us in all of our afflictions so that we may be able to what comfort those who are in any affliction with the what comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by whom by god for just as the sufferings of christ are ours in abundance so also our what comfort uh, is abundant through christ but if we are afflicted it is for your comfort and salvation or if we're comforted, it is for your what? Comfort, which is effective in the patient enduring the same suffering which we also suffer. Verse 7, and our hope for you is firmly grounded, knowing that as you are shares of our suffering, so also you are shares of our comfort. Isn't that a very comforting passage? Ten times he says it. Ten times he uses the noun and verb form of the same little word, paraklesis or parakaleo. Parakaleo to be called alongside. Paraklesis to be alongside. And those words mean comfort, mean encouragement. In fact, in English, these words are translated beseech, comfort, exhort, desire, pray, entreat, consolation, exhortation, comfort, entreaty, encouragement. Get the idea? When you and I come alongside of other believers, when you and I speak the word of God, When you and I allow the Holy Spirit of God to encourage us and to prompt us to come alongside of someone and to say to them, the Word of God has blessed me in this area. May I share it in your life? I see you're struggling. I see you're sorrowing. I see you're needy. I see that you're you're growing in your Christian life. Let me share a Word of God with you. You and I get to partner with God. You know what's neat about that? You don't have to go to school. You don't have to have a degree. You don't have to go to a class. All you have to do is let God do it in your life and then share it. It's something, uh, and, and I heard something. I wasn't in all of discovery class this morning, but when I got there, it was really a blessing. But when I got home, Bonnie gave me the full report. And she said, someone said something there. It was very interesting. And, and this is what she told me. She said, someone said, you know what's neat? In our church, we all can minister, and there's no one ministry that's greater than the other ministries. They said, you know, sometimes, you know, if you're involved in that ministry, you're really something. But if you're in that ministry, you're not really anything. But the emphasis in the church that Jesus Christ established is not if you're in the big ministry or in the little ministry, but if you're ministering for Christ, serving. How do you serve Christ? Here is a very clear, and I'm going to blow the trumpet for this. All of us, at any time, anywhere, with just a rudimentary knowledge experience from this book, can be involved in building up Christ's body. How? By comforting. How do you comfort? Well, look at verse 3. Point number one, the source of comfort. What's the source of comfort? Verse 3, blessed be, this is a a doxology, a a, a beautiful praise-filled expression of the Apostle Paul, but look what he says, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, 
the Father of mercies, this is beautiful doxology, the God of all comfort. What's the source of comfort? Is it from me? Do I somehow have to kind of, you know, do some kind of spiritual bodybuilding, you know, and pump up like, like a, a, a discharge for a, a gun? You know, you have to, I remember those old water ones, you'd pump the air in, you know, in these little rockets, and you'd finally get it, and you'd push the little button, and it'd go, you know, and it'd take off and squirt water on you. You know, when I was a little boy, I used to do that all the time. Do, I, do we have to kind of go around so we can squirt on someone some comfort? No. It's not based on us. The source of comfort, verse 3, is what? Who? It's God the Father. He is the source. God is, has devoted himself to being the God who is characterized by comforting. And so what, what's neat is that we come representing him. When I used to sell Anison, I mean, I don't know anything. Anison, Tristan, all that stuff, Advil, I didn't know how they made it. I didn't know what was in it. I just sold it. American Home Products, $12 billion, stood behind it. I just said, hey, you buy it, they'll deliver it. I mean, if a $12 billion corporation can deliver, can you imagine what God the Father can deliver? He says, I'm the God of all comfort. All I want to do is allow you to be a channel through which my comfort can flow. Have you signed up with him? Said, hey, I'll let you run that through my pipeline. You know, we have someone here that, that people get paid uh, or, or this company gets paid because people put their oil through this company's pipeline. They have this big pipeline. It just sits there, and people's oil goes through, and they charge them to run it through their pipeline. You know something even better? God will pay you if you let his comfort come through your pipeline. If you will invest your heart in his church, the church. That's why greeting time is so important. That's why the early church five times was commanded to greet one another. Why? You go up and say, hey, where'd you go to lunch? I went to lunch over here. What'd you have? I, I mean, that's one thing you can talk about. That's great, but that doesn't have any internal value. You can come over to someone and say, you know, I notice I've been watching you. You, you kind of sit back kind of quiet. How are you doing? You know, you might have someone break down in tears. You might have someone really tell you something. Have you ever gone up and said, how are you, and had someone tell you, and you kind of said, well, yeah, I wasn't expecting you to tell me, you know? Uh, but, you know, we're, we're so superficial. How are you? Great. How are you? Great. Fine. Oh, good. Huh, bye. You know, it's, but, you know, the, the church, we are pipelines. We're, we're, we've got the whole reservoir of God behind us. And when we come to someone and say, how are you doing? They say, I'm not doing very well. You can say, well, you know what? Let me tell you this. 2 Corinthians 1, verse 3 says, God is the God of all comfort. I want to remind you what the Bible says, that the Holy Spirit came to come alongside you and to encourage and comfort you, and God's Word promises it, and you can experience that right now. That's all you have to say. You don't have to... You don't have to squirt anything on Him. God does the comforting. A lot of people are, are unwilling to serve the Lord because they don't think they have it in them. If you're saved, you got it in you. You have all the power of God. God is the source. Verse 4, secondly... The sharing of comfort is God's delight. He's devoted to it. He says, I'm the God of all comfort. But look at verse 4. Who, that's God, comforts us in all our affliction so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction. You notice the absolute nature of this? God says, I'm going to comfort you in all your afflictions so you can help someone in any affliction they go through. Now, you say, you know, I had a flat tire last week, or I lost my job last week, or, you know, something, and I didn't feel any comfort at all. God offers the comfort, but we have to receive it. Have you ever thought about that? Have you ever thought about how many blessings we don't get from God? It's, it's beautiful in the Old Testament. verse I quote often, Oh, that thou wouldest have hearkened to me. Then should thy peace have been like a river, and thy righteousness have been as the waves of the sea. God says that he wants to comfort us. He wants to pour out his blessing upon us. And so often we are looking everywhere but to him. And so we don't experience his comfort. We don't accept it. We don't acknowledge it. It's present. One of the saddest verses in the Bible is when Jesus was ministering. And these people came that were so needy, but their hearts were hardened. And this is what the gospel writers record the power of the Lord was present to heal them. But he didn't. Why? Because they were so hard-hearted and resistant and closed them out. 
He was ready. He was standing there, ready to deliver, to free, to, to heal, to cleanse, to deliver them. But they wouldn't let him because they were upset and didn't believe in him. How often do we act like unbelievers and we don't accept the gracious comfort of God? God, who in verse 4 wants to be sharing his comfort, he delights to share it. That, that, and, and I'll finish the verse that with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God, we can comfort others by the comfort that we're comforted of God. Do you know the only thing that would keep us from being a pipeline for God tonight is if we don't let him comfort us. How does God comfort us? We allow the Holy Spirit to come alongside our life. We allow the Holy Spirit to point out to us as we read this book with an open heart the areas in our life that God is sending affliction into our life to remove. And we let him remove it. We let him sever those ungodly relationships we might have. We let him trim away those things that distract us from his glory. We let him keep us focused on him, and we don't let other things crowd in. We don't let things grieve the Holy Spirit. We don't let things quench the Holy Spirit. That's how he comforts us, when we respond to his gentle touch. Because God's gentle touch gets stronger and stronger and stronger, especially if we're born again. He says, I'm not going to let you go the wrong way. I'm going to pull you back, pull you back, pull you back. He says, I want to share, and I want you to share my comfort, and I want to share my comfort with you. It's my delight. I'm the God of all comfort. Verse 5. The source, verse 3, of comfort is God. He's devoted to it. The sharing of comfort is God's delight. He wants to give us comfort in every situation of life. Thirdly, in verse 5, let's look at the supply of comfort. He says this, verse 5, For just as the suffering of Christ are ours in the abundance, so also our comfort is is abundant through Christ. The supply is not like, you know, the, we've got to cut back the pumping of the oil because we're going to deplete this pocket, you know, it's going to run out. Or we can't, you know, we can't run full bore because we're going to run out of fuel. Or we can't do that, we're going to run out of financial resources. Or we can't do that, we're going to run out of energy, you know. Can't do the Boston Marathon because we'll not have enough strength. The supply is limitless. Look at this. The supply of comfort is God's department. God says, you can endlessly be offering my comfort because it's not from you. We saw that this morning in 2 Corinthians, the same book, chapter 4. Do you remember that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us? God says, I take the weak. I take those that are... In fact, just keep your finger here and look back at 1 Corinthians 1. I've quoted this so many times and some of you might never have read it. In, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, this is what he said, starting in verse 18. For the word of the cross, that's telling people that Jesus died on the cross ignominiously for our sin and became sin for us, is to those who are perishing foolishness. That Greek word is moria. We get the Greek word, or the English word moron. You know, you, you, that's a disparaging term. Someone's a moron. It's not a nice thing to say about anybody. It means that they're uh, moronic. Uh, they don't, they're foolish. God says... Perishing people think it's moronic, foolish to talk about the cross of Christ. But to us who are being saved, being saved, salvation is not only a one-time event, it's a process because we are not yet fully in the day of salvation. Well, I'm still in this fallen body, aren't you? Uh, I mean, I'm still tempted and tried, aren't you? And someday, the ultimate of our salvation is that we're no longer going to be around sin. We're going to be in his presence. Now, we are secure until that day, but it's not, God's not finished is what we're saying. And he says, we're being saved. Every day we're being saved from the power of sin. Someday we're already saved from the penalty of sin, but someday we're going to be saved from the presence of sin. All of this is by the power of God. Now look, here's God's plan. For it is written, verse 19, I'll destroy the wisdom of the wise, the cleverness of the clever I'll set aside. Where is the wise man? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater? Hasn't God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For since the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom, did not come to know God, God was well pleased through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe? Now we have to be careful. We can't improve on God. God says, not clever techniques, not new and novel methods, not, not great marketing techniques. He says, it's the foolishness of preaching the gospel that saves people. That's something we have to remember. You get around to it. You've got to tell people they're sinners and Christ died for sin and he offers a free gift if they'll receive it. I mean, it's just the simple gospel. Verse 22, For Jews ask for science, Greeks search for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified. To the, the Jews a stumbling block, the Gentiles foolishness. And then he talks about those who are the called, both Jews and Greeks. Christ is the power of God. 
and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. Now listen to this, 26. For consider your calling, brethren, that there are not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things which are strong. He's talking about us. We're weak. And he's strong. We're foolish in the world's sight, but we have God's wisdom. Verse 28, And the base things of the world, and the despised, God has chosen, the things that are not, that he might nullify the things that are, that no one should boast before God, but by his doing, you're in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption, that as it is written, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. That whole thing can be summarized by this. God wants us to realize apart from him we're nothing. And through him we're everything. And it's not our strength, his strength. It's not our wisdom, his wisdom. It's not our might, his might. It's not our ability to pump up some encouraging words. It's his power flowing through us. Back to 2 Corinthians 1 real quick, because I want to wrap up this chapter and, and tie this all together. Verse 3 of 2 Corinthians 1. The source of comfort is God's devotion. He is devoted to this. His name is the God of comfort. Secondly, the sharing of comfort is what God delights to do. He wants to, to comfort us in every affliction in all times in our life. Thirdly, the supply of comfort is God's department. He says, don't worry about the supply. I'm in charge of it. Now, here's the secret of comfort. Verse 6. But if we are afflicted, it is for your comfort and salvation. Or if we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which is effective in the patient enduring of the same suffering which we also suffer. You say, what's that? The secret of comfort is how God designed it. God designed it that, that if we're afflicted and, and he comforts us, then that's a comfort to someone else. If someone else is comforted, then, then that's a comfort to us too as we see God working in their lives. And what it is is God has designed all this to work together. That he is the one who is bringing to pass all the afflictions that happen to us in our life to refine us so that we can call out to him and receive his comfort. And that not only are we comforted, but as we receive comfort, those around us are comforted too. Do you see why it's so important to look up? To not lament sickness. To not lament failure of our health. To not lament the financial vicissitudes of life. It's to let God comfort us through that. And sometimes God does all that just to get our attention, so we'll let him comfort us. Uh, you know, often when I have the kids on my shoulders, I, I like to just shake a little bit so that they can know that I'm holding on to them. I just want them to be reminded that, that Daddy is taking care of them. I had one of the little buddies yesterday. I was practicing with him, and I had him uh, stand up, and I said, jump to me. And he jumped to me. I says, jump to me again. He jumped to me again. I said, close your eyes and jump to me. He closed his eyes and jumped to me. You know, that is absolute faith. And you know what? If you never trick them, they'll always believe you. And if you can have them trust you, you can tell them the great secrets about God, about why God made them, what he wants to do with them, about their body, about their future. They should trust you, parents. Don't trick them. You know, I never trick my kids. I never play tricks on them. I never uh, say, blah, blah, blah. oh, I'm just teasing. No, it, it's such a crucial... Now, it's not, nothing wrong with having fun with them, but never trick them. God doesn't trick us. And he said, I want you to know that I am the God who will always comfort you. I will always flow through you. I will always be there. Okay, verse 7, the secret of comfort. Verse 7, For our hope for you is firmly grounded, knowing that as you are sharers of the suffering, so also you're sharers of our comfort. The secret is this. God is going to deliver the comfort needed in every situation. And that's why, and, and we're going to conclude with how we can actually apply this, that's why God says that there is two departments that we're involved in comfort. Number one, it's personal, upfront, face-to-face -face with people. Number two, it's on our knees, on our faces before God, praying for their comfort. And those two are supposed to all be involved in to build up this body, and that's what I want to conclude with. But look at verse 8. Uh, we've seen the source and the sharing and the supply and the secret of comfort. But, verse 8, when are we candidates for comfort? Verse 8, the first one is, For we don't want you to be unaware, brethren, that our affliction which came on us in Asia, that we were burdened excessively beyond our strength, so we despaired even of life. You know what the word despaired is? There's no way out. 
The Apostle Paul said, it got so bad that I couldn't see a way out. When are we candidates for God's comfort? Number one, when there's no way out. When you can't see a way clear. When you can't figure out how to get out of this situation. Look up. God is offering comfort at that time. First time, when there's no way out. Verse 9. When we come to the end of ourselves, verse 9, Indeed, we have the sentence of death within ourselves in order that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God who raised the dead. He says, when we come to the end of ourselves, when there's nothing else we can do, not only when we're hemmed in and can't go anywhere, but when we realize there's nothing else in us, we can't do anything else, we're a great candidate for God's comfort when we're at the end of ourselves. That's why I read those quotes to you about those two men. That says that they were wretchedly depressed and they were murky in their lives. You know what that was? That wasn't to discourage us. That was to encourage us. That's when those men found their comfort. Jowett and Spurgeon. And those men impacted their whole generation. Before radio and television, they spoke to tens of thousands of people in that condition. Why? Because they couldn't see any way out and they were at the end of themselves and they were candidates for God's comfort. Verse 10 is another reason when, or another time when we're candidates for comfort. Verse 10, who delivered us from so great a peril of death and will deliver us, he on whom we have set our hope, and he will yet deliver us. You know when we get comfort? When we look for God to comfort us. Remember he said a few months ago we looked at temptation, I said there's always a lit exit door, he'll always make a way of escape when we're tempted so we can escape it and say no to it. You know what else? When we're hemmed in and despairing and can't see any way out and we're at the end of ourselves, he's on his way to deliver comfort to us. How often have we muddled our way through and never looked up and gotten lower and lower and lower? And you know, it's times like that when we slip into sometimes into sin. When we just take things in our own hands like Abraham did with Hagar, like Moses did killing the Egyptian, like Peter did swinging his sword madly around and cutting off Malchus's ear. We take over. And those times are always bad. Don't accomplish anything for God. When we're at the end of ourselves, when we're hemmed in, when we're despairing, when we see no way out, look up. Look only to God. Verse 11, the last point Paul makes is this. He said, we're candidates for comfort when there's no way out, when we come to the end of ourselves, when we look only to God. But verse 11, we're candidates for comfort when we ask for God to supply it. Look at verse 11. You also joining in helping us through your prayers. That thanks may be given for many persons on our behalf for the favor bestowed on us through the prayers of many. Do you realize that we can ask for God to supply comfort to ourselves and to others and that he will respond? Now there's something interesting to consider. The sovereignty of God is that God has planned to accomplish all these events that we read about in the scripture. The responsibility of us is that he's going to use the agency of us to lead people to Christ. You say, what if I'm not doing it? Then he's going to use someone else and you're going to miss the reward. What if I'm not asking for comfort? Then God's going to take you through so you won't fail, but you're going to miss the benefit of receiving his comfort and being a blessing to others, which is a a rewardable thing to allow God to comfort us in our trials and to let our life of comfort be a blessing to others. Look at Johnny Erickson Tata. You know, the only difference between her and a whole bunch of people that line the, the rehabilitation centers of our country is that she is not bitter about what God did to her, as people complain about. She has made her paralysis, her quadriplegic state, into a blessing. Why? She has received the comfort of God. She looked up. She looked to him. She said, I can't turn anywhere but to you. That's why that song, Make Me a Blessing, is so beautiful. Well, let's conclude. What if we don't yield to the Holy Spirit's prompted ministry of encouraging and comforting the body of Christ? What if, to be specific, we won't let Christ transform us and control us and reveal to us our duty to minister in this way? Well, let me read to you what one doctor wrote about our human bodies, and I think it has a great application to our spiritual lives. This is what he wrote. He said, sometimes a dreadful thing occurs in a human body, a mutiny. It's called a tumor. 
A tumor is called benign if its effect is fairly localized and if it stays within the membrane boundaries. But the most traumatizing condition in the body occurs when disloyal cells defy inhibition. These disloyal cells multiply without any checks on their growth. They spread rapidly throughout the body. They choke out the normal cells. White cells armed against foreign invaders will not attack the body's own mutinous cells. Physicians fear no other malfunction more deeply. It is called cancer. For still mysterious reasons, these cells, and they may be cells from the brain, from the liver, from the kidney, from the bone, the blood, the skin, or other tissues, grow wild, out of control. Each is a healthy, functioning cell, but it is disloyal, listen, no longer acting in regard for the rest of the body. Did you know that happens in the church? People say, I'm going to live for myself. Serve? I'm not going to serve. That's a disloyal cell in the body. We were saved to serve. We were saved to minister to one another. We were saved to share the encouragement of Christ with one another. Even the white blood cells, this doctor said, the dependable palace guard can destroy the body through rebellion. Sometimes the white cells recklessly reproduce. They clog the bloodstream. They overload the lymph system. They strangle the body's normal function. This is called leukemia. This is how the doctor concludes. I love it. He was a Christian. Because I'm a surgeon and not a prophet, I tremble to make the analogy between cancer in the physical body and mutiny in the spiritual body of Christ. But I must. In his warnings to the church, Jesus Christ showed no concern about the shocks and bruises his body would meet from external forces. The gates of hell will not prevail against my church, he said flatly, Matthew 16, 18. He moved easily unthreatened among sinners and criminals. But Jesus cried out against the kind of disloyalty that comes from within. Few doctrines are more important than the church. Because of the constant attack from the outside, we need to be good students of the subject. Because we are fellow members of his body, we need to apply ourselves to mutual harmony. Because disease can diminish the effectiveness of the body, we must maintain habits of health, a consistent program of exercise in harmony with God's bodybuilding program. Furthermore, a regular checkup by the great physician is a must, not once a year, but at least once a week, and be prepared for the cost of that visit. Good doctor, right? Turn to Romans 15. We're going to conclude with this verse because I want to show you how to apply this comfort and not be a mutinous cell in the body of Christ, but all of us to work together. Because God can encourage us by his word through the Spirit, but sometimes he wants to use other believers to encourage us. Because Paul was never ashamed to ask Christians to pray for him. And in most of his letters, he mentions his great need for prayer. In Romans 15, and look at verse 30, I want you to hear the heartbeat of Paul before we go. And I want you to maybe think about that, that prayer sheet you have a little differently, our vine, and to think about the class roster you might have, and to think about your shepherding list, those of you who are under shepherds of the flock, and to think about your uh, ladies' Bible study and men's Bible study table group that you meet with, your small group, and to maybe think about your Sunday school class a little differently, and maybe to think about your family a little differently, and maybe to think about the list of missionaries that's in the bulletin a little differently, because you tonight can hook on and become a major pipeline carrier of God's comfort. And he'll just run the meter as much as you want to be used to let his comfort flow through you. Look at Romans 15.30. This is what Paul said. Now I beg you. It's pretty strong. Romans 15.30. I beg you, brethren, through the Lord Jesus Christ and through the love of the Spirit, that you strive together with me in prayer. Strive agon. We get the word agony from that in English. He says, I want you to agonize with me. I want you to strive with me. I want you to, to soon agoge. I want you to, to agonize with me. For what, Paul? In prayers to God for me, that I may be delivered from those in Judea who do not believe that my service for Jerusalem may be acceptable to the saints, that I may come to you with joy by the will of God, that I may be refreshed together with you. You know what he said? He said, you can encourage me by praying for me. He said, I've never met you folks in Rome. He said, I haven't been there yet. But I'm counting on you to do something. I'm counting on all of you to open up the pipeline. 
and let encouragement flow through you and to be counted in eternity as a reward, an imperishable reward, by you, unseen by anyone but God, upholding in prayer my life. For God to do some specific things, to be delivered from those in Judea that don't believe, and that my service for Jerusalem will be acceptable, and that I could come to you with joy by the will of God, and that I can be refreshed. Did you know that's a simple thing? You can pray for your teacher of your Sunday school class to be refreshed, to be able to minister unhindered. You can pray for their study time, that they would be encouraged by seeing the hand of God working. You can pray for those faithful ones who right now are working in the nurseries and have kids crawling all over them and pulling on them and, and, you know, drooling all over their shoulders and pulling their hair and pulling their earrings out. I mean, all the exciting stuff goes on. I mean, I have a lot of children. I know about all those exciting things. You can pray that they'll be encouraged in that and realize that what they're doing there counts for eternity. You can pray for those that come here during the week and they they clean up the mess that's all around this building. You can pray for those that come here and faithfully stuff the bulletins, those that come and put the books back on the shelf. You can pray for those that that are busily filling the, the track racks, that are changing the missionary boards. You can pray for the missionaries. What a group. How easily they get discouraged. They're not home for Thanksgiving. Probably won't be home for Christmas either, most of them. Be a pipeline. How do you build up the body? Ten ways? Well, this is the first of ten verses I'm going to show you about how we can pray specifically. For those that are away from us, but for those that are right here, we can talk to them directly. Personally. Did you know you can get a reward in heaven tonight in the car by speaking a word of encouragement to your family member, by getting on the phone and calling someone and saying, I'm praying for you. I love you in Christ. How do you build the body of Christ? Comfort one another with his word. And let the God of all comfort supply you with his comfort that will flow through you into the lives of others. I hope you'll be a pipeline for the Lord. I hope you'll practice it. It's something everybody here that's born again can do. And you can do it for the glory of God. Let's bow together. Thank you, dear Father for the joy we have of being your servants. And I pray that every one of your saints will make a choice to let you flow through them and comfort those saints around them. For Christ's sake.